uh, system introduce introduce our distinct version. Okay. Um, so, but uh, uh, ancient months ago, uh, uh, Lenny Joyce, uh, uh, our former director of the and, uh, and uh, energy management, uh, he came to talk to me. Uh, I can see the excitement from his eyes. Right? So uh, he said, "Max, you gotta introduce, you gotta bring Carl Taylor to the research com community here." He said, "I just had a had a meeting with him." Uh, has a lot of energy, want to do something different, and uh, very motivated to do So you gotta do your job. So here, you know, here it is. And uh, after some introduction, I came to him, you know, he really had a lot of energy. Uh, he had so much energy <coughs> that that's around five miles this morning. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, so how had been with uh, NASDAQ and currently, you know, I'm a great for a long time. Uh, he joined NASDAQ. Is this the only, this is the only company in the world? That's, that's correct, 32 years. 32 years. Year. And uh, he started with uh, a fresh, uh, you know, double E major. Uh, started with NASDAQ and then uh, working at a different part of NASDAQ, you know, as he was, uh, as he was president of NASDAQ Solution as an energy survey company. Uh, before he became the president CEO, he was the uh, vice president of customer service. That, that brings a very different perspective. Uh, so Carl received his bachelor degree as RIT and MBA. Um, uh, so uh, let's have a world uh, welcome. So thank you for that introduction. And uh, <clears throat> you'll excuse my voice. I um, I've had the privilege of meeting, I'm going around the state and meeting with all the employees of the, the New York companies that uh, I oversee. So I've, uh, I've been talking a lot more than I'm used to. So if I sound a little scratchy, it's, uh, it's because of that. But uh, yeah, I, I think you know, it, it's important to understand where we've come from to, to really understand where we're going. And, uh, and that was kind of the perspective. When I sat and thought about what should I tell what I call aspiring in people we're going to affect the industry going forward. Uh, you know, what should I tell them about maybe the past a little bit? And then what are the key questions that we need to be thinking about uh, in the energy sector? Um, as, as was spoken earlier, uh, I started 32 years ago, and I actually started as a generation planner. So we used to have in the company, NYSIG and RG&E, these utility companies, generation planning. We had transmission planning, which, by the way, my wife was a transmission planner for the company. I met her my first day at the company, so two good things happened on that day. Started a great career, and I met my wife. Um, I usually say it in the other order, but she's not here, so I, you're videotaping this, so now it's been recorded. Uh, but, the, but the reality is, um, you know, and there was also distribution planning. And, you know, when I thought about how do you, how do you, what do you title a talk, and usually it's, you know, you come in and you talk, I said, how about revenge of the distribution planner? And I'm sure you're all asking yourselves, what does Carl mean by that? What does he mean by revenge of the distribution planner? So, so let's go back in time a little bit, if you will. And you, you think about the electric industry and, and the utility industry as a whole. And these competing things we're seeing here uh, are still relevant today. The environment has always been kind of a, it's always the secondary what happens is we, we affect the environment, and then we decide that we shouldn't have done that, and we need to do something about it. And I'll illustrate that in a second. You know, technology's always been moving and changing, even though you could argue that the state of change and where we're finally getting to in technology and the utility industry and the energy business is finally coming of age. Because it's really been, to me, left behind at times, uh, believe it or not. And then reliability. Uh, we, we, we almost take that for granted today. I don't, because every morning when I wake up and there's 50 customers out in a small town in somewhere in upstate New York, you know, uh, I'm not happy about that. And I can assure you those 50 people whose phone isn't working today or they can't charge their phone or they can't have their, their food is spoiling, they're not happy either. Or the place they go to work, they can't go to work today because it's not open for business. So we're always very concerned about that, but it's foundational. You know, this is what it looked like many years ago. 
And if you think about it, the industry actually started as a, 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 an awful lot of microgrids. We didn't call them microgrids at the time. They were basically communities. And these communities were serving themselves. Now, today we're using these fancy terms, microgrids. And what we're talking about there, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is you know, what are we doing within the greater grid that we've built today? But this is what it looked like of age. And some of the wires you see on the right side, you know, anybody here from India? In other places where you saw a lot of distribution and you hadn't necessarily come to the realization that it might be a monopoly business and it might be better to just have one person running all the wires. And as that development occurred, you started going, this is really not very efficient. So efficiency back then was defined as running too many wires to the same premise and et cetera. And how can we, we evolve from that? But something happened later. We started moving away from these small communities because it became big communities and big cities. But we also realize there's resources located in other areas that aren't located where the source of the load or the customers are, where the consumption is going to be. And how do you connect the two of those? We had you know, a, an awful lot of growth. And I show the hydro project here in Niagara Falls because this was one of the very large commercial installations that had tons of potential but no place to put the power. And if you were to talk to somebody at Hydro, Hydro Quebec today, because we're actually developing a project where we're trying to bring power out of Hydro Quebec through Maine and down into Boston, same thing. All this abundance of capacity, but no place for the consumption to locate it. So this started to evolve, which then caused us to decide, you know, number one, we need to elect, we need to provide electrification. So it's ironic. Today we're talking about things that you take electricity for granted, but there was actually, you know, the Rural Electrification Administration really was around, what that was about is getting electricity to everybody. Everybody deserved to have electricity. And if you think about it, you know, every community couldn't just produce its own little microgrid, especially in the rural community. So now we started to distribute that, those, that central plant to different places. We talk about the environment. So we had technology, and this is a picture actually of the city of downtown of Rochester. So if you look at what happened over time, you know, we moved into this least cost planning focus. But the environmental impacts of some of the things we were doing along that way were not considered until after. And if you look at the picture here, you can see you know, what the environment started to look like through that evolution. We, we started moving towards talking about cleaner air. Now, it's ironic. We're not really talking about clean air much anymore. We're actually talking about you know, removing carbon and other things. So the cleanup is at a different degree. But the reality was we started moving from central generation plus transmission because the generation was locating in rural areas. The load was in the cities. We started trying to connect those two. We could do a lot better job of controlling emissions from these central plants than we could necessarily from all of these small, the small, what I call the microgrids of the past. These pictures I put in here just so that most of the people in the room don't know what most of these devices are, maybe. <laughs> so it might be a learning experience for you. But, but the reality is, you know, we saw a huge increase in growth in the United States, both on the load side and the generation need. You know, everything was moving at the time to electrification because most, most of the things weren't electrified originally. People forget that. You were, you were, you know, we're gasifying, we're using gas uh, in a different form than we do today. So we really were evolving the industry and moving into this, what I called, this was the first phase of electrification. Some other devices that were high tech at the time, once again, the need was there for more and more electricity and making sure it became more and more reliable and stable. New age occurred in 2000 time time. And uh, I, was, I was at NYSIG uh, working there. And we owned generation as a company. We used to own the transmission, all the transmission. We owned all the distribution. And basically, the, the relationship to the customer at the time. If you look at where we evolved to today, we're a networks company. What happened? There was a need to create a competitive environment around the generation side of the business. And what happened was, uh, and I, I lived through this, we started in the early 90s 
with creating what we call avoided costs or projections of cost in the future with the idea that we could privatize the generation side of the business. No longer would we make it a monopolistic business. So we brought privatization into the generation side of the business. And it is today. It's a very competitive business. Uh, utilities like ourselves were, I'll say, encouraged and motivated to divest our generation plants to help facilitate that privatization. And sometimes you need to move something from a monopoly business or other types of business to really get privatization moving. You need to kind of basically move, move the assets from one to the other through different mechanisms. And that's what we did. So we sold all of our generation. The only thing we have left at NYSIG today, we operate a few hydro plants in Rochester and up in the Adirondacks, but very little generation do we actually control and or operate today. Okay. The next evolution occurred right after that, which was actually on the retail side of the business, believe it or not. So the retail side of the business was still a monopolistic business. We, if you came and moved, and you probably moved here, you probably live somewhere nearby, you call up NYSIG and you ask for your service to be turned on, and we send you a, bu a bill every month. Hopefully it's accurate, but you're usually not very happy about it. I understand that. <laughs> Nobody's ever happy about their electric and gas bill. Uh, so with that said, though, they, they came a period of time recently where retail choice was also being looked to be kind of what I call privatized. So consumers should have the right to choose who supplies the kilowatt hours that they're purchasing or the decatherms that they're purchasing. So today, NYSIG and RG&E, the companies that I run, we will provide those services to you. We are what we call the provider of last resort, the default provider. And this is something in the U.S., when they, when they went to this retail choice or competition on the retail side, one of the things we, we didn't do, we didn't do it like we did at the generation side. Each state did it differently. So in New York today, if you sign up for your electric and gas service, you default to service from me as a utility. And you can choose to opt to another retailer. That's up to you. You get to do that. Uh, so it's an opt-out program. Other states, like Texas, actually created an infrastructure where every customer is with a competitive retailer. The, the, the distribution company only provides distribution services. And in Europe, that's typically the model that was adopted there. The only nuance was Texas kept the meter, believe it or not, the meter infrastructure with the utility company, the, the distribution company. In Europe, especially the UK, they did not do that. The UK actually moved the meter as a competitive device. I'll say it that way. It's, it's, I think they're looking back on that. It probably wasn't the best decision uh, because it's, it's instrumental to the revenue stream associated with the, uh, what I'll call the, the distribution business. But we, we'll, get, we'll digress off of that for now. What we're seeing, though, is you know, large-scale and small-scale distribution energy systems starting to reemerge within this macro system that I've already just defined. So if you think about this, we have this large infrastructure. We have all these large power plants. We have all this transmission infrastructure today. We have distribution networks operating. The generation part of the business is competitive. And the supply side of the business is competitive. And you have a networks company in the middle. And that's where we, we come in to play. Okay? We're, we're seeing what, what's being asked in this network system that we operate is, is changing and evolving significantly. So what do I mean by that? So I talked earlier about the fact that I worked in generation planning. My wife was a transmission planner, and we had these folks work in distribution planning. And back in the day, generation planning and transmission planning, we were kind of the, I would say, kind of the kings of the castle. Big, large assets, uh, big decisions, long life assets, where we decided to site that next generator, which was going to serve us for the next 30 to 50 to 100 years, you know, was taken in the context of where do we think the load was going to be, where are the consumers going to be, where's that consumption pattern going to be over that long period of time. You know, how do we get it there? Do we build trans, trans, you know, transmission? Or do we locate it maybe closer to where the load centers are, but most likely that wasn't going to happen because nobody wants it in their backyard, right? So you, 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 the two groups, the transmission and generation planners, were actually very tightly together in what we called integrated resource planning. So you did this in an integrated fashion such that 
you took into all the different cost components and tried to come up with a least cost solution to serve that future load for the next 30 to 40 years of that consumption. The distribution system was really a slave to wherever the people decided to live. So if population growth occurred somewhere, you know, the distribution transmit, the transmission generation planners, we were making sure energy could be delivered and there was adequate capacity on the system. Distribution planners were really making sure that if you built a new plant or you built a home, that the transformer and the wires associated with getting to you were there. It's a very dumb system. Some people say, well, that's not a very technical term, Carl, but, <laughs> but it's very true. Ironically, it's still not very smart. So when you think about that and you think about what we're talking about here with battery storage facilities, a lot of small scale battery storage is being introduced to the network. Where is it being connected? To the distribution network. Where's a lot of our smaller scale solar, up to five megawatts of solar being connected to the distribution network? Very little going to the transmission network at this point. You think about the EV electric vehicles. They won't be connected to a transmission line. Ultimately, they might be. So when you see this evolution occurring, you know, we start envisioning today's microgrid. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I look at it as fortunately. Some of my colleagues say the opposite. Uh, I think that's a big opportunity. So I have, a, I have a network that I told you is not very smart. We've got all of these new components and technology being introduced onto that network. And for me, that's an opportunity, right? Because the good news is if you don't have something that's very complex and very smart, it's, it's much easier to adapt it to where it needs to go versus trying to throw it all out and start over again. Now, it's an interesting perspective because most people would kind of go, yeah, but Carl, if you, if, you'd, if you'd made it smarter earlier, you'd probably be in a much better position to handle all of this coming on. I don't know that any of us would have predicted 10 or 15 or 20 years ago what that was going to look like or what it may look like still. So from my perspective, you know, there's an opportunity here. Let's build the smarter grid that's going to be required for this evolution in this process we're talking about, for these new technologies to come on. So I, I look at that as, as a big opportunity for the business and, and something that we can take advantage of. And we, not necessarily the utility companies, but industry as a whole. Because the slate is pretty much today, we have a network that's available to move kilowatt hours or decatherms. And I'm talking about decatherms still, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some questions around that in the future of that business. But the reality is we have a network that's capable of doing that. And the reality is we can modify it, in my opinion, to what the future needs going to be. The trick's going to be, for me, is when do you do it, how fast do you do it, and what do you do to it? And that's something we think about all the time. So where, I, where, I, where I'd like to conclude on that particular component is uh, you know, we're sitting here today Six years ago, we contemplated automated, automated meter infrastructure, AMI, smart meters. You know, I'll, I'll use different vernacular, and eventually everybody will go, yes, I know what Carl's talking about. Uh, we contemplated putting that in. We, we, built, we built it up at Central Main Power, another utility company we own. We have it uh, basically around the globe. We're installing it today, uh, which for us is kind of the, the basic fundamental piece of infrastructure of equipment we need on this network to begin to make it smarter. It's been very difficult, believe it or not, to get that project approved. There's the political desires are not necessarily there at times, although it's one of the few technologies I think about that gives consumers information that they deserve to have and need to have as they're going to affect this, this, this kind of this microgrid concept that we talk about. You think about the utility itself, uh, it's not very efficient, believe it or not, to read your meter every other month. And we send somebody manually to do that. Somebody asked me one time, why don't you do it every month? Because then I'd get an accurate bill every month. The reality is it, it costs twice as much money. And most people don't feel that that trade-off's worth it. We, we'd rather not read any meters manually any longer. 
but have that available information available to consumers within uh, on a, a one-hour basis or whatever basis we all think is appropriate. Or in some cases, it could be even seconds of data, uh, depending on what kind of response we're looking for. So we're starting to move in this avenue of making the grid smarter, but we, we know there's a lot to be done. The distribution network has a lot of work to be done. The other challenge we have as a business, which is kind of ironic, is it's an old system. The average age of a substation in the NYSIG grid is 50 years old today. I have poles, wood poles that are 83 years old and still functioning. So it's a good pole, still doing its job, but the reality is, you know, we're, we also have this challenge of how do we rebuild that grid? And why do I bring this up? You may have heard these terms, non-wire alternatives. It's, 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 and if you're in the wires business, it's kind of a, a term you, you, you kind of first, you, you kind of tighten up a little bit at first. Like, why would I want to do a non-wire alternative if I'm in the wires business or networks business, right? But the concept is pretty simple. You know, are there other alternatives today, given the, this, this change that we're seeing from a technology perspective, where, where the consumption patterns are, what the future will look like? Are there other alternatives besides just building a new piece of hardware that we've traditionally done in the past? Can we look at something that is different? For example, you know, if a solar facility of two megawatts locates near some load that we have, you know, is that creating an environment whereby now that substation and the transfer capabilities are actually reduced potentially in that area? Or can we introduce technology so that if somebody wants to site more generation in an area where the distribution system couldn't handle it, can we introduce some new technology whereby they may have to curtail a few hours? But the reality is the economics still makes sense to do that plant there versus trying to build a whole new distribution network or transmission network to serve and take, and take that capability. Those are what we talk about with non-wires alternatives. We're now hearing about non-pipe alternatives on the gas side. Anybody live in Lansing? Okay, we've got a few people. You know, Lansing is gas constrained right now. We don't have enough physical capability to move the amount of gas that we need to into that community. Um, and, and I tell everyone, you know, as a networks company and a networks business, I'm not here to choose what consumers want to use to meet their energy needs. My goal is to deliver what they ultimately choose. You know, I have, sometimes I feel like I'm in the middle of a fight and I don't want to be in the middle of a fight because it's not my fight to fight, <laughs> right? So, but the reality is you have people who want more natural gas for their immediate needs or future needs and have a vision of that. And we have other folks saying, given what these other objectives that we have a, from a policy perspective going forward, that's really not the right decision. And how can we find another alternative that fulfills the need, the energy need of that community, but at the same time, we don't build more infrastructure and obviously burn more carbon and create more carbon. Da, da, da. So you, you, see where, you see where that's going. So a couple of key questions that I, I think about when I talk about the future state, and um, I do have a lot of energy, excuse the pun, but I, but I do. Uh, and I do think about these things, and these are things that kind of keep me up at night sometimes. And partly because, you know, I, I sometimes feel we, we forget about the consumer. I think in the future, in the future industry, the consumer is going to be critical. And I think it's not because of the consumer who's 55 years old and with, been with the utility industry for 32 years, but it's, it's the people in this room quite frankly. What your needs are, what you think of energy, what you think of societal impacts is much different than I believe a generation or two ago. So I think you know, we've got to somehow talk about the customer and the customer preference as we talk about energy, energy delivery, and where we're moving in this, this future state. The decarbonization, it's, it's, it's a great term. I'm not sure that everybody knows what it means yet or what the true impact will be. I think everybody desires it. 
I don't know that the path to get there has really been defined. What do I mean by that? So I talked about integrated resource planning of the past where from a utility perspective, we kind of owned all the pieces and it was very easy to, to have these analysis and studies done whereby if you did this or located something there or chose this technology, here's what the impacts would be. And then you also had all the other pieces associated with that, whether it's transmission or other types of investments you needed to make. Uh, today, we've got very large policy goals. And I don't think anybody's arguing that we, we shouldn't achieve those goals. I don't hear anybody raising their hand saying, well, maybe a few people, but that's a political discussion for a different time. <laughs> but the reality is I don't think anybody says it's, it's a bad thing to move towards you know, less carbon in the environment. I, I don't think anybody says that. And doing it quickly, I don't think anybody would argue that either. The path to get there, I think, is what's still, it, I, I think about, is, is, is a challenge. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's easy to say that we should have 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind generation as part of getting us there. And I'm talking about New York State. I think it's a noble goal. If you think about offshore generation, wind generation, it's quite an interesting technology. Uh, we're in the wind generation business. Avon Grid, who I'm part of that company here in the U.S., you know, we're the third largest wind generator in the United States. We're the largest, and uh, Ibadrola, who's our largest shareholder, we're the largest wind generator in the world. So the prospects of having 9,000 megawatts of new generation off the coast of New York uh, is, is not a bad business proposition for us, given that we, we, you know, we, we like that business. The reality, though, is how does that contribute ultimately to this big picture of how we're going to meet these objectives for 2030 and 2040? Have we pieced all that together? Positive with that particular initiative, it happens to be right near the load. So it's very unusual for us to build generation where it's actually being consumed. Uh, but the reality is that's only one piece of a lot of different things that are going to ultimately get us to that goal that we, we're, we're aspiring to by 2030, 2040. And I'm not so sure that everybody's looking at all the pieces and saying, here's a variety of options to get there. And then how do we choose that path that gets us there? I think if we rely on the markets just to get us there, I'm not sure that uh, that path will be, uh, it might be very painful. I'll say it that way. Full electrification. We hear that term all the time. A lot of discussions on, is that really realistic? Does that really get us to meeting the other objective I just talked about. Um, not convinced it does. If it, if it is the answer, uh, the electric infrastructure will have to evolve and change drastically. The investment requirement alone would be substantial. Now, if anybody can figure out how to get rid of all those wires and move electricity and energy around in a different way, um, I think there's, there's something there. But the reality is, as we know today, based on the physics principles and whatever, full electrification, uh, I, I think that term is used a little bit too lightly. And I don't know that it's realistic, ultimately, to solving the problem. Future of natural gas fossil fuels. So I, maybe I didn't mention we're a natural gas distributor and electric distributor. We own natural gas companies in Connecticut, Massachusetts, a small gas company in Maine, and in New York. When you'd make a natural gas investment, whether it's a pipe, small pipe to a house, or a large transmission infrastructure, you know, the general life of those is 40 to 90 years. It's a long-term investment. And if you sit here today and you hear people talking about we shouldn't be burning natural gas, even though it's one of the cleanest fuels we do have, but it's still, you know, in 1980s, by the way, <laughs> natural gas was praised as going to get rid of all the other dirtier fuels. You know, that's, that was the mindset. We weren't really focused on necessarily carbon at the time as much as we are today. So uh, the flame wasn't as important as all the other emissions associated with burning you know, this, this, this fuel. You know, here we fast forward 30 years, 30 some years now, and you know, natural gas is not clean either, given the standard we're talking about. So we're sitting here today as a company investing in infrastructure. Uh, and most of that infrastructure I explained yesterday a little bit is, is not about necessarily the growth. Growth is starting to get constrained based on communities not wanting it. We're not being allowed to build new transmission systems. Uh, new York is pretty much running out of capacity. 
and I joked this morning or today in a meeting, it doesn't do me any good to build a distribution pipe to somebody's home if I can't put any natural gas in it to supply them the fuel they actually desire. So, you know, it's great to have roads, but if there's no cars on them, I'm not sure you need the roads. Kind of simplify the... So, you know, you, we've got to think through this as to where do you put the investment? How much investment do you put? If you're in my shoes, do I want to invest billions of dollars in an infrastructure that, quite frankly, I could be taking a, an accounting write-off for those accountants in the room, uh, 30 to 40 years potentially now because it's not used and useful any longer and I'm not allowed to collect money on it. So you have to think through that. Uh, we, you know, we don't talk much about this, but I think you know, most, most economists will say this will be the evolution of that market. It came, it rose, and now it's going away, just like some other things have done in the past. Uh, but there are financial consequences associated with that, and by the way, that infrastructure is very dangerous. Can't underestimate and talk about the safety associated with natural gas. There's an old phrase out there, natural gas goes boom. <laughs> it's a terrible phrase, but it does. When I drive down the road, if I don't see markings on the highway, it looks like somebody didn't get the you know, call before you dig, I stop. I do. I tell everybody in my employees, stop and make sure they have called to dig because if they dig into that pipe, you know, it may, they may explode, that community may be, have an explosion, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We take it for granted it's not because it, we don't have a lot of accidents, but recently we had one in Massachusetts, substantial, you know, substantial accident. There was one death, overpressurized the network, uh, caused a drastic problem, and of course it happens at a time of year that you would never want something like that to happen. So it's very dangerous. And safety is at the all-time important. So we have to invest in it while we continue to, to utilize that system and make sure we keep it safe and make it even safer. But the reality is you, you're going to see some conflict here of how much investment do you want to put into this while you're using it at the same time you theoretically could be retiring it someday. New wholesale market design. For some of you in the room, you may be looking at today the economics of electricity and there is a market and yesterday in one of the panel discussions there was a gentleman from the New York ISO independent system operator so they actually govern and they actually manage the electricity wholesale market so what they're doing is looking at all the generators who want to supply into the marketplace and they're also looking at you know what I would say the, the buyers of that okay that market was really based on a lot of economic theory around variable cost generation well, if you look at the new assets that we're building that are much cleaner today, there's a very high fixed cost and a very low variable cost associated with them. So if you think about the market design, and what they do is they take least cost, variable cost units, and they dispatch those first. And then as you ultimately get to that, where you meet the load, the, the amount of capacity required for that given moment, you know, that becomes the price set for the generators. Sounds simple. It was a good model when all the when you're trying to get efficiency out of the variable costs associated with generation. Uh, we're, we're kind of flipping that around, and the question is, can you fit the new technology in, in, into the potential old market, or do you need a completely new market? I'm, there's a little bit of uh, frustration there. I'll say it that way, because ultimately, you know, we are talking about economies here when we talk about energy and, and, and the cost of energy and, and what have you. Advancements in nanotechnology, you know, I think we're just, just starting to get there. You know, solar technology looks, doesn't look very pretty today, you know, big, big solar panels and what have you, but I'm sure if you talk to folks here on campus, you go to MITs and other universities, you know, they're focused on how can I turn this, this, these, I call it the ug ugly panels into something that's very, very small, clear. Maybe every window has it on it. It's a film. And it's now absorbing energy just like a solar panel, that traditional solar panel we see today is. You know, that's coming very quickly. Ironically, though, there's also a study to show the evolution of all these new things is the same 10 to 15 year cycle, just like it was building the car in 19, you know, 1920s and 30s. So, there, but the reality is, I think we need to be thinking about because what I just described to you is still going to evolve very quickly and change. And then one question I don't hear anybody asking and nobody talks about, what is this all going to cost? 
So we're going to look fast forward to 2030, 2040, and let's assume we put a stake in the ground and we've met the Gov Governor Cuomo's objectives. Who paid for it? How much did it cost? Or how much is it going to cost? What's it going to cost going forward? Yeah, it's one of those few times where we're usually very good about asking, hey, what is that going to cost me? I don't hear that. We don't hear our consumers asking that question. It may be good because if you assume that the evolution of the technology and all those other inherent things, and I take offshore wind generation, for example, nine years ago, we would have told you onshore is three times cheaper or one third the cost of offshore. We used to say that we would never build an offshore generator in the United States. Why? There was so much land to put onshore ones. Why would you ever do that? In the meantime, I just told you we won an RFP for the first large scale offshore wind generator to be built off of Massachusetts. We bid that at about seven cents a kilowatt hour. Offshore generation not too long ago was, you were talking about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. So you're seeing huge economies of scale and efficiency in the technology. These generators are two, eight and a half to nine megawatts per windmill or wind turbine versus one and a half, two and a half you see driving around the various areas. So a lot of movement in that, but I think we've got to all focus on, you know, what is ultimately the cost? And it's not to be a, a, what I call an inhibitor to the progress, but I do think we need to understand that because if you think about what I started with, this integration planning and this concept of there's a lot of varieties of ways that we could do this, uh, we might want to take a look at what might be the least cost, what might give us the best result, what, what the timing impacts associated with that, and bring all of those components together. I'm not sure that, from my vantage point, that's being done in a manner which it should be in the future. So with that, I think my time is about up, and I want to be on time. So, and I don't have all the answers to these questions. I might have some opinions. Uh, but the reality is, I think it's something that, as you're thinking about what you're doing, uh, what, where your focus is uh, in the energy sector, you know, these are some key things that we'll ultimately need to solve. And I think a lot of them will take care of themselves, believe it or not. I really do. I think, uh, I think there's, where the technology is moving and where we are from a system perspective, we do have kind of a slate to do a lot of things and not have to throw everything away to make that happen, which, you know, I know it sounds odd to you, but uh, for me, that's a real positive. Uh, the reality is it's hard to change things once they get implemented, especially in the utility industry. We have a tendency to move slow for various reasons. I'll say it that way. Uh, the reality is I think we need to move faster, and I think we have a blank slate to do that. So with that, uh, Max, I'll go to you. We have an interesting one with the ACS plant up the <coughs> lake that used to be coal fired, and now they want to shut it down and they want to keep it going for stability. And uh, New York City doesn't want to pay a premium to keep it going because they don't like the president. Would you comment on that interesting situation? I don't know if I can comment on the last part, but I'll comment on most of that. How's that? Um, yeah, so for those who don't know, yeah, we, we, and we used to own that facility, by the way. It used to be called Milliken Station. It was a gas-fired facility. We ultimately cleaned it up a little bit with FGD and other coal-fired, yeah, coal excuse me. And it was, uh, we added FGD to that d during the period of time we owned it. Uh, it was a very economic plant at the time <laughs> coal was economic. Um, yeah, they're going through an evolution process because you know, they, they, they're talking about converting it to natural gas to try to save the plant. Um, I, I think they've got a tough road ahead of them, to be quite candid with you. Um, it doesn't fit the model of all the things I just described. It will burn more natural gas in the state, not less. Uh, yes, it's cleaner than coal. Uh, the reality is I, I don't think the, the local community necessarily, they want it from a business perspective. They don't want it from the environmental perspective. Um, as far as the system goes, you know, we've made some investment in that system so that we, we plan for that plant to someday retire. So the grid itself has been modified and, and the transmission system has been changed so that whether that plant's there or not in the future, um, it, uh, it's, it's really up to the market. It's not up to 
the, the grid itself or you know, reliability or other concerns at this point. <laughs> I'm being sensitive on my answer on that, but. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you for everything you've been saying today. That's really quite uh, useful for me, anyway, to learn a bunch of those perspectives. Uh, I've been involved a lot in getting new solar development done. I'm in the town of Dryden, but uh, mm -hmm. I've been de dealing with it throughout Tompkins County. Uh, and I've learned in the process that, especially with the larger project like community solar, uh, the number of sites are very constrained because of the availability of three-wire service nearby. How does that fit into what you've been talking about? And how come the point we actually improve that situation? Yes, yeah, so give you some perspective. Um, we have approximately 140 megawatts of distributed generation online today, you know, which is up significantly from where it was. If all of the developers today who have proposed projects uh, were to come online, we would have almost 600 megawatts at NYSIG of you know, generation capacity uh, entering. And to your question, unfortunately, there's, a, there's this, this problem of where are the physical assets to move that energy uh, versus where can you site those projects. So the best place to site a solar farm or uh, you know, those types of installations, especially these are up to five megawatts now in size and, and getting bigger. And there's some being proposed much, much larger. Uh, and to cite those, you basically want to put them in what I call an old farmer's field. I grew up on a farm, so a lot of vacant land you need, bottom line, a lot of space. Uh, unfortunately, that's the same place we haven't built a lot of infrastructure, physical infrastructure, to export that energy to where it needs to get to. So that's a real challenge for us. Uh, and, and it's really an economic challenge. I, I think given the market today, which is part of the issue in some respects, right? So there's market forces that say it's a good time to build these facilities due to certain credits and other things that are available. And quite honestly, you know, the production costs are coming down significantly. So it's the right time to do it. The reality is, as we're putting them in, we're trying to find that road of how can we afford to build all the infrastructure associated with bringing all that in. And it's a real challenge for us because as you know, anything we spend money on is ultimately getting absorbed by the consumer. And then who's getting the benefit ultimately to that? Um, I, I think you know, that, that's, that's a real challenge for us. I will say this, though. My business philosophy, two things I care about in the networks business that I talk to all my employees about. I care about a lot of things, but two things I always focus on. Customers first, number one, because we're not very good at that sometimes, the utility side. People believe we don't care. I, I, it drives me nuts. We actually do care. We really do care. I want your power to be on all the time. I want that light switch to go. I want it to be as cheap as it can be. Uh, I don't want to charge you more than I have to. Uh, so I do care. The second part, though, is I want things connected to my network. It behooves me in the network business to not get as much stuff connected to it as I can, especially when I can provide the opportunity, whether there's excess or what have you, to help move that energy to where maybe where it needs to be to help balance you know, these different equations which never do balance, are, are never in balance when you talk about setting a new plant in one place and in the, in the load somewhere else. So we need to provide that mechanism. So my answer to you is we're trying our darndest to do it. There is economics associated with this and costs to customers and rate payers, as we call them. Um, and we're trying to balance the two of those. But we, we want them on. It's just a matter of whether or not that developer, uh, and, what, and the way it works from a social economics perspective, um, if we do something specific for, let's say, a project, and there's no other need for that improvement in that area, uh, that, that upgrade to the system, it, usually the cost is borne by that particular project. And there's different ways to do that. In the gas industry, one of the things they did years ago to promote natural gas growth, what they did is they, they did the same type of equation, but what happens is as others started to add on to the system, then the contribution was decreased over time. So it's kind of a contribution problem versus the economics of the project. Uh, so that, it, it's a real challenge for us. Uh, we'd love this, you know, it'd be nice to say we're just going to upgrade everything and not charge the developer or what have you for it, but the reality is consumers are going to have to pay for that. And then the question becomes, you know, who you socialize that cost over. 
That's, that's our challenge there. But I can tell you, it's not because we don't want the, the solar industry to prevail and, and grow in the industry. So I want to give a tune to yes. Is the best way for the ISOs and utility models to evolve to meet the higher uh, market penetration of intermittent distributed sources, particularly now that consumers can also act as producers? Yeah, so it gets to that evolution of this market, right? Um, and how do you, so I think a couple things have to happen. One is from a macro scale, you know, I think we do have to look at the market itself today and what that's going to evolve to, and I kind of covered that a little bit. More to your point, though, I, I think. There's, there's a gap in the marketplace. So as I talked about the distribution network and where that needs to get smarter from a technological perspective, there's also now the thought of it needs to also, you need to create a market around that distribution network. So that, because there is value to providing, let's take an electric vehicle that would provide service to the grid potentially, but also be taking service from the grid. And how do you value that? So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. And you know, you think about distribution system operations is running the system, but I also think there's this notion of do we go to a, a more granular market that would help a, take into account the products and services that the electric grid is going to need, as you described. I think it's going to happen. I think it has to happen. The challenge is going to be right now the mandate. There's a federal mandate that controls transmission, and there's kind of this line of demarcation around transmission and distribution. So then the question becomes, who is going to fill that gap from a market participant perspective? And I think that's an opportunity from my vantage point. Other people wouldn't, you know, whether the New York ISO or some other market agent wants to do that or maybe chooses not to or maybe doesn't have the jurisdiction to, or to some other market participants or other private participants create a market around that. I think the latter might actually be the reality someday. Okay, so there's a lot of questions. Uh, Sorry. We have a launch discussion right after this. It's 128 uh, Right down the hall. Uh, you're welcome to continue the discussion after this. Please. Um, yeah, I was, uh, um, what was my question? I just, I just uh, ate my questions. Um, you thought of lunch, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Others? Okay. Okay, um, because our students you know, demand uh, to, to uh, complete uh, the NRSA on, on time, so uh, we are about 110. Uh, do you have, okay, so you, you may know that, you some may know uh, Carl has been very helpful. Uh, he came uh, yesterday, uh, came yesterday afternoon uh, to present in the energy grid panel uh, organized by the uh, energy system club, right? Uh, we really appreciate uh, it. So, he came back, didn't even, you know, have a finished even stay for dinner, and then came back, uh, you know, went back to Binghamton and came back this morning. Right? Uh, so yesterday you have one of these. Right? <laughs> uh, but I was told, even though the bag looks exactly the same, right? but uh, what inside is very different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs>